I'm here at the political centre of London. Obviously, the Houses of Parliament behind me, just down the road, is the Prime Minister's residence at 10 Downing Street. And just across the Irish Sea uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, we've had uh, today the end of the G8 summit. The political bigwigs, actually front men for the real power in the hidden hand, um, that have been discussing, among other things, the subject of Syria. And in the last few days we've suddenly seen the European Union uh, remove the ban on supplying the rebels in Syria with uh, weapons and we've had uh, a Barack Obama saying that the United States will now supply the rebels with weapons because the uh, regime of uh, Assad in Syria has crossed the red line which is using chemical weapons upon the so-called uh, rebels without any evidence whatsoever by the way but they need to do something for reasons I'll come to. What I just want to do for visitors to the website is put what is happening in Syria in some perspective. We have had for some years now what has become known as the Arab Spring and what that has been uh, portrayed as and promoted as is uh, people of uh, the Middle East and North Africa uh, spontaneously uh, rebelling against oppression and tyranny. Uh, that's the way it's been promoted because that's what the system, the hidden hand, wants us to believe is the situation. Um, I said uh, a week ago at the Bilderberg uh, gathering uh, just north of London that the Arab Spring could be described in a single sentence. It is people with brown faces being played off against people with brown faces so that people with white faces can steal their land. And that is what we are seeing and Syria is just another step in a long, long planned, way, way back long planned uh, series of uh, countries being hijacked and taken over uh, with the Arab Spring as the front and the excuse and the cover. In my books over many years, I, I've been pointing out way back at the time of the Iraq invasion in 2003, that this is actually a sequence of events that's long planned. They're not random invasions of countries. They're not random rebellions against the incumbent, regi incumbent regime. And uh, here's, a, here's a couple of um, pieces of background to that. General Wesley Clark uh, is uh, a former Supreme Allied Commander Europe of NATO and he said in a television interview in 2007 that just days after 9-11 the following happened when he uh, visited the Pentagon. Remember days after 9-11. In fact as he says about 10 days after 9-11 I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary uh, Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the uh, people in the joint uh, staff who used uh, to work for me and uh, one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, uh, you've got to come in and talk to me for a second. Uh, well, you're too busy, he said. No, no, he says, we've made the decision. Remember, this is 10 days after 9-11. We have made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. No one's talking about this. Blair's not talking about it, Bush is not talking about it, but it's all there waiting to go. They're just not telling us. And so in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, Blair was running this place at the time, and, and Boyd Bush, they were saying, well, we're, we're still trying to get a peaceful settlement. And knew all along they were going to invade. Liars, liars, liars. Anyway, Clark uh, goes on. Um, I said, um, this is the 20th of September uh, uh, 2001, I said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? He said, I don't know. He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So I said, well, did they find some information connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He said, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. Um, and then he said, uh, Clark, so I came back to see the same guy uh, some weeks later, a few weeks later, and by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, 
Oh, it's worse than that. And he reached over to his desk, picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I've just got this down from upstairs, meaning the uh, Secretary of Defense's office, Rumsfeld's office today. And he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. And I saw him a, a year or so later, and I said, you remember that? He said, sir, I didn't show you that memo. I didn't show it to you. So here we have a situation where all these countries that have been picked off, um, and, and Syria is the latest they're trying to do uh, that too, they were all planned long before. Not only that, in September 2000, uh, 12 months before 9-11, the uh, so-called neocon group, neoconservatives, that controlled Bush and the Republican Party and came to power with Bush in early 2001 uh, when he, he became president, they produced this document in uh, September 2000 in which they called for um, multiple uh, wars uh, in multiple countries by American forces and that the countries they named that they wanted to, to, to attack were these same countries that Clark's talking about uh, plus uh, some others. So it was all planned. And then more recently, um, a former French foreign minister said that Britain, uh, this buddy lot, had been planning a war against Syria for some two years before the unrest broke out in the Arab country. Exactly what I've been saying for years. The statement was by Roland Dumas and it came during a recent interview with the uh, par uh, French parliamentary TV network um, LCP. And he's, this is what he said, I'm going to tell you something. I was in England two years before the violence in Syria on other business. I met with top British officials who confessed to me that they were preparing something in Syria, he said. He continued, this was in Britain, not in America. Britain was organizing an invasion of rebels into Syria. They even asked me, although I was no longer Minister for uh, Foreign Affairs, if I would like to participate. Responding to a question on the motive behind inciting uh, violence in Syria, Dumas said, very simple, with the very simple aim to overthrow the Syrian government because in the region it's important to understand that the Syrian regime makes anti-Israeli talk. And then the former foreign minister added that he'd been told by an Israeli prime minister a long time ago that Tel Aviv would seek to destroy any country that did not get along with it uh, in the region. And it's not just about Israel, it's about the acquisition of country after country across the Middle and Near East, North Africa, and then going deeper, deeper south into Africa that has been planned for decades and decades and decades. Now, how are you going to pick country off after country? Well, first you want a major trigger that can start the process. We know that trigger as 9-11. Uh, 19 Arab hijackers that couldn't fly Cessnas did not fly wide-bodied jets in a way that professional wide-body jet pilots have told me they could never do. Uh, and they were not behind 9-11. It was, as they say, an inside job, a problem-reaction solution. Create the problem, get the reaction, do something, offer the solution. Solution, war on terror, invasion of Afghanistan. We're on our way. Now, we need to go into Iraq next. Now, we can't, you know, keep saying it for the same reason because people might cotton on, there's a pattern here. So we have to find different excuses for the same process of acquisition. So um, weapons of mass destruction. We don't even need a real problem to justify going into Iraq. We'll just tell them there's a problem that doesn't really exist. And Blair, like I say, who was running this show uh, here at the time, absolutely knew there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So did Bush. They're both professional liars uh, just to persuade people that this action should take place to serve the master plan and the masters they serve and push this agenda on that I'm talking about. So then they want to go for uh, Libya. 
Oh, right. What can we do there? Weapons match destruction. We've used that one, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I know. What we'll do, I've got the great idea. This is, this is how we'll work it. What we do is we'll train and arm rebels. We'll put our people on the ground while saying we've not got any people on the ground. And then we'll get our rebels, mercenaries, um, to attack uh, the regime of Gaddafi. At this point, no one says a word, okay? Shh. No government reaction, no media reaction. Shh. And then the Gaddafi regime will respond to that uh, attack. And at that point, trigger everybody. Microphones everywhere. Media, off you go. He's killing his own people. And so you then create a hysteria and you create a madness that goes like this. We, NATO, have to go in and bomb the Libyan cities like Tripoli, uh, Tripoli to protect the people from violence. And you bomb the crap out of the place, you, you, you slaughter mass of people, you destroy cities, you take what was the most um, uh, economically uh, successful country in uh, North Africa. In fact, you know, in many ways, Africa overall. And you destroy it. And the, the uh, tribal wars that Gaddafi, for all his faults, was, were, was actually keeping a handle on, now that's gone, now we have constant civil war in Libya, constant ongoing violence. But the outcome, those that were behind the uh, invasion, that's what it was, now control the oil and they control what was before the semi, at least semi, independent banking system. So now, okay, tick, 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 who's next? Syria. Okay, Syria, why do we do that? Well, it worked in Libya, didn't it, mate? I mean, let's try again. So, provable fact, loads of the rebels that were fighting Gaddafi were moved into Syria. And they start then doing the same thing. Uh, they start uh, attacking the Assad regime. Shh, don't say a word. Shh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's going to retaliate. Go, microphones, 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 media, off you go. He's killing his own people. And they tried for so long to, um, if you like, legally supply arms and uh, other support to the rebels. But they couldn't, they couldn't get it through. So they did it covertly, as they always do, through places like Qatar uh, and Saudi Arabia, who were just, you know, satellite states of NATO um, in, in the region. Um, and terrible atrocities on both sides, but terrible atrocities by these Rebels have gone on uh, constantly, including chopping people to pieces. Um, but the rebels have been painted by, by this lot, the government anyway, and, and the American government, etc., as, as oh, the good guys. Keep it simple, good guys, bad guys. No, no, no shades of grey. Um, but what has happened recently, and th they thought they were going to do a Libya. They thought they were going to get rid of Assad very quickly. It's not happened. And what has happened in the last few uh, weeks is um, Assad's uh, forces have been taking back uh, areas of, of Libya, of uh, Syria, which the rebels had, uh, had held. It was going pear-shaped for the, this, this lot and the others around the world. So suddenly, as this was happening, the EU dropped the ban on supplying weapons to the rebels. And suddenly, just by coincidence, uh, Assad is said to have crossed Obama's red line by using chemical weapons uh, with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. And so what we are uh, looking at here is not protecting civilians, just as it never was protecting civilians in, in Libya. We're looking at an effort to, to make sure this, uh, this rebellion, so-called, removes the Assad regime so another tick goes on the list and it's off to Lebanon and off to uh, Iran.